Hi everyone, uh, so this video is for uh, the chapter 4 lecture, so let's dive right in. Um, as you can see, this chapter is titled Internal Control and Cash. Uh, so our learning objectives for this chapter, we want to describe fraud and its impact. Um, while this is kind of a unique topic to put in here, it fits right in with the topic of cash. If you read the chapter, there's a great story about a major fraud that happened at a coffee company. I think it's really interesting, uh, very real world. So we'll see why that's important. We'll explain the objectives and components of internal control. We'll evaluate internal controls over cash receipts and cash payments. Um, the main kind of analysis or to-do in this chapter is preparing a bank reconciliation. So we'll go through that, and then we'll report cash on the balance sheet. Uh, before we dive in, let me just take a step back, because when we finished Chapter 3, we effectively finished preparing the financial statements. And now, what we're moving to is really de a deep dive into things like the um, balance sheet and some of the other financial statements. So here I just have Apple's 10K and I pulled a few pages from it just to kind of um, show you what we're going to be concentrating on. So as you can see, you know, this is a fairly large document. If you watched the introduction, introductory video to this class, you saw um, that it's like almost around 100 pages. Um, for this class right now, we're concentrating on this financial statements and supplementary data section. And specifically right now, we are mostly going to spend our time with the balance sheet, right? So this is the balance sheet for Apple. And effectively, what we're going to be doing is moving down the balance sheet and covering all these topics. So right now, we're essentially on topic one, cash and cash equivalents, right? Apple also has short-term current assets, so short-term marketable securities. We'll look at that. Um, accounts receivable, we'll look at that. Inventories, we'll look at that. Um, we won't really look at some of these more unique things like vendor, non-trade receivables, um, and then there are some other current assets. A lot of this you'll cover in future classes. And then they have long-term marketable securities, which we'll also cover, property planning equipment, which we'll cover, um, and we'll go down to liabilities and cover all of these, right? And we'll cover um, non-current liabilities, and we'll also have a chapter on stockholders equity here. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of give you some perspective of where we are and where we're going. So right now we are in chapter four, gonna focus on cash and cash equivalents. So let's dive right in. So first thing is describing fraud and its impact. What is fraud? It's really the intentional misrepresentation of facts right? You're trying to get somebody else persuade another party or get somebody else to act in a certain way. Fraud will cause injury or damage, right? That's why it's such a negative thing because somebody generally gets hurt because of fraud. Uh, this is actually a growing problem, um, especially with the expansion of e-commerce. When we do transactions online and the buyer and seller never meet and don't half the time don't even know who the buyer or seller actually is, um, obviously that leaves a lot of room for fraud. And so this is becoming a big problem. Here are some ex common examples. Insurance fraud, right? If you file an insurance claim and lie, that's actually considered insurance fraud. Check forgery. Right? Never ever sign somebody else's name to a check or anything like that. That is fraud. Medicare fraud. This is a huge problem in the United States um, where people, where Medicare gets billed for doctor visits that, are, that never happened or things like that. A credit card fraud. Again, applying for credit or taking out any sort of loan and lying on the application. Identity theft is becoming a huge problem where somebody uses your social security number and information to take out loans and those loans never get paid back and then somebody comes after you for money you never took. <clears throat> There's really two main types of fraud. Misappropriation of assets, just a fancy way of saying stealing. And fraudulent financial reporting, just a fancy way of saying lying. So you're really stealing or lying, right? For stealing, this is very often committed by employees. Those tend to be the biggest culprits. I know you hear on the news that you know it's other people, but really it's employees very often who are responsible for stealing. Um, very often they steal money or inventory, right? So if you ever worked at a store like Best Buy, you know that they have very strict inventory practices. 
Um, there's all sorts of bribery and kickback schemes, right? Um, there's been pretty much anything you can possibly imagine has been thought up and tried or successfully or unsuccessfully. Um, very common, and it feels innocent, but really it isn't, is overstating expense reimbursements. So if you go on and get a job after college, and let's say you travel for your company, and they reimburse your meals and other expenses, um, empl sometimes employees will tend to lie a little bit and pad those expenses. So maybe they paid $25 for a meal, but they'll write down $30. Um, so that's a problem as well, and that is a uh, fraud, even though it doesn't feel you know, like a major thing. Um, fraudulent financial reporting very often is committed by managers. Uh, they're putting in false or misleading journal entries. The goal is to deceive investors and creditors. Very often these people own a large stake of stock in the company and they're incentivized to have the stock price go up so that their wealth can grow. So that's a problem as well. Um, you will hear this. This isn't just specific to this class. The fraud triangle is something that you'll hear in many other classes. Um, essentially, they did a bunch of studies and evaluated all sorts of situations where fraud happened and tried to find some common themes across all the different instances of fraud. And the common themes that they found is that just about every instance of fraud involves a motive an opportunity to commit the fraud, and a rationalization. A, that's just a way to explain to yourself that it's okay, right? So very often somebody who commits fraud isn't like a natural born criminal. They might actually be quite an honest person, but they can rationalize to themselves how this makes sense. So let's talk about internal controls and the objectives and components of it. So what are internal controls? They're really the primary way to prevent, detect, and correct fraud. Right, So con internal controls can be all sorts of things. Again, back to the example of Best Buy, um, if you notice, if you go into a Best Buy store, there's usually an employee working at the front of the store checking receipts for people who are walking out, right? So that's an example of an internal control. Um, not only does it prevent customers from walking out with stuff that they haven't paid for, but if they're able to check the receipt, they can also see if an employee is working with a customer, you know, maybe their friends or something like that, and doing something inappropriate or, or anything like that. So that's an example of an internal control. Obviously, you can also have internal controls like passwords to get into a computer, things like that. So there's all sorts of internal controls. Um, <clears throat> there's really five objectives we're trying to accomplish. Well, you want to safeguard assets, right? You want to encourage your employees to follow the company policies. Um, you want to have operational efficiency, right? Make sure everything runs smoothly and efficiently. Um, you need to have accurate, reliable accounting records. Remember, if you're a chief executive of a company, you are signing off on those accounting records saying that they are accurate and uh, they don't have any material issues with them. And um, if you lie, to that, you can go to jail. So um, you're also trying to comply with legal, legal requirements. Um, this is just a excerpt from a essentially a 10K. Um, what, what it's saying here, and you can read this in any companies, pretty much every single company is going to have something that sounds like this. The key here is that management is responsible for establishing and maintaining adequate internal controls over financial reporting. And there's an entire career out there um, in accounting and financial services where you go to companies and you test their internal controls, right? It's a great career. You make easily over $100,000 a year. It's very in demand because this is a really big deal, especially for big companies. So this is just showing you something that would be found in a 10K where management is describing you know, we are responsible for internal controls, we have tested them on and on, and then the CEO will actually sign off on that. So here's just a visual of the point of internal controls, right? You have the company assets, and you're trying to build this wall, trying to prevent them from fraud, waste, or inefficiency. Here's another visual that talks about the components of internal control. So if you think about it, control procedures and the information system, it's kind of like the front door to this to the company, right? So those things try and kind of keep the the door locked, let's call it. Monitoring, it's like your the windows into the system, looking through and monitoring is everything working, right? 
uh, risk assessment is kind of referring to this smoke that's coming out of the chimney. It's looking at the company and trying to um, identify what are the major parts of risk uh, for this company. So for example, you know, if I am looking at a bank that holds a bunch of cash in its teller, uh, at the, in the teller drawer, right, then I'm going to have different internal controls that I have to think about than if I run a iPhone store that doesn't take any cash. You can only pay with a credit card, right? Obviously, cash is not going to be an issue, but inventory is going to be an issue because people will want to steal the iPhones. So that's what risk assessment deals with, looking at a company and saying, what is it that we need to concentrate on here? What are the risks? And the control environment, think of it as the roof on the house. It's kind of what is the tone at the top? How do the, you know, how do the, the senior leaders act? Um, how are they, um, you know, showing best practices? And what are some of the rules within the company? And are they being followed by everyone and everything? What is the overall environment in the company, right? Is it very strict and everyone is expected to follow the rules? Or is it kind of one of these startups that's like, a, you know, Wild West um, inside? And so obviously that's going to create different issues. So here's just those components instead of in a um, picture, they're just described in words. So just what I said before, control environment, kind of the code, of, co uh, the tone at the top, code of ethics, the risk assessment, what are the business risks for that, and then establish procedures that deal with those specific risks, right? So there is no one internal control that might make sense across all companies. Every company has to identify their risks and um, act accordingly. The information system, this is really important because this is how accounting information enters and exits, right? Nobody sits in a paper journal anymore. Everything is done in a computer system. That computer system is also accurately tracking assets, profits, losses. So the information system is key nowadays. The control procedures, again, these are just the um, means by which companies gain access to the five objectives of internal control, which we discussed on that earlier slide and then monitoring the internal controls. Most often monitoring is done um, through into technology and it's also looked at by internal and external auditors. So external just means you work for a separate company and internal are auditors that work at the company. So like auditors that work at Apple that work in the company. By the way, this can be an awesome career. Um, you usually get to travel to all the different locations of a company. So a company like Apple that has locations in almost every country in the world. Um, if you're somebody who enjoys traveling and making good money, being an internal auditor can be a really very rewarding career. So let's look at some internal control procedures. So first key is smart hiring practices. Most companies will do extensive background checks, invest a lot in training and supervision, pay competitive salaries, right? Um, have clear employee responsibilities. You're responsible for this, you know, she's responsible for that, and et cetera, et cetera. This is really important and something to kind of think about um, personally nowadays, right? In the world of social media and Facebook and LinkedIn, um, there's a lot that can be found out about you, and a lot of times companies will decline somebody um, from a job because of something they find on their Facebook page or um, their LinkedIn profile or whatever, their case may, whatever the case may be. So be very thoughtful, and background checks are pretty extensive now, and companies will get bothered by things like DUIs, uh, domestic violence, um, anything like that, anything that's on your record. Um, is likely to raise red flags, even if it's not directly related to your job. So if you're going to be in business, and especially if you're going to be in finance, be very, very thoughtful about the image that you're portraying out into the world. Another key thing is separation of duties. In fact, we're going to talk a lot about um, internal controls around cash. Like 90% of the time, the issue is separation of duties. You never, especially when it comes to cash, you never want to have the same person handling the cash, recording cash transactions, and approving transactions. Like if you read, definitely read the story at the beginning of chapter four about the coffee company and the fraud that happened there, and you'll see that that um, chief financial officer had just way too much power. There was no separation of duties. So when it comes to cash, 
most of the time the answer is separation of duties, right? People handling the cash should be different from people recording transactions. <clears throat> There's also comparison and compliance um, monitoring. Budgets are just preparing future financial statements. So you're kind of showing what you expect to happen into the future. And so this is very helpful because you can compare your expectations to what actually happened. And if there's a big difference, you can do what's called exception reporting. So the computer can say, you expected to have cash of 100 come in this month, but only cash of 40 came in, right? Why the big difference? And so you can go in there and say, okay, well, maybe we didn't sell a big uh, transaction that we were expecting, or maybe somebody is stealing cash, right? So that's very helpful. And auditing, going in and figuring out, you know, um, kind of go working backwards and seeing what exactly happened step by step to make sure that there's no fraud um, going on. It's important to keep adequate records. So that's very important. Um, detailing business transactions, right? You can have hard copy documents or electronic. A lot of stuff is going electronic now. It's helpful to have pre-numbered documents. So if you think, if you write checks, what that means is think about your checkbook, right? Each check has a unique number. The idea there is it's very difficult to create a fake duplicate document if every document has a unique number or code on it. So pre-numbered documents are also a popular way to prevent you know, duplication and fraud. Another key um, procedure, limiting access. Um, really, look at somebody's job responsibilities and limit their access to only the things they need, right? Things like lock and key is simple enough. Uh, so physical access controls, doors that are locked, um, passwords and encryp encryption for anything that's electronic. Getting proper approvals, right? So a management's general or specific approval. Um, sometimes management may delegate the approval to a specific department, right? So for example, if you look at even a college like DVC, they will have a purchasing department. So if I, as an instructor, want to have uh, markers for my class, I have to go to a special department and tell them I need markers. They will look at the list of approved vendors and use competitive bids so they can get the lowest price. This would prevent me from essentially partnering up with a friend to sell me markers to DVC at a marked up price of like $10 per marker, and then we split the difference, right? So we, what we do is have a proper approval in place and have the purchasing department have control over this. The information technology is key. Again, all accounting is now done in IT systems, right? So more and more is based on IT and less and less on manual procedures. So things like electronic sensors, barcodes, right? If you go to stores, it's almost impossible to find a store nowadays where somebody keys numbers into the register. All of them have barcodes. Some safeguard controls, um, holding important documents in fireproof faults, having burglar alarms, security cameras, loss prevention specialists. Again, Best Buy, Costco. I think I've even seen in some Walmarts where you have some employee at the exit of the store checking receipts, things like that. Fidelity bonds on cashiers. So if you're going to take a job as a cashier, some companies will, for, will get you to have a fidelity bond. What that means is you go to a, this separate bond company, and this bond company does a background check on you and basically ensures your employer that you will not steal from them. And if you do steal from them, the bond company is going to pay back your employer. So think about how deep of a background check they're going to do if they're giving that guarantee. Right. So, again, it's if you're going to be in business and finance, it's so important that you never have issues with the law because anything on your record is going to create a lot of issues for you. Um, also, mandatory vacations and job rotations. So I used to work on Wall Street and I was on a big trading desk um, out in London. And so um, one of the thing, issues that we had in, on Wall Street in trading was that some traders would take these big positions that they weren't allowed to do. They were basically trying to show a big profit for the year so that they can get a big bonus payout. But sometimes those positions didn't go their way. Sometimes those trades went the opposite way and they had this huge loss on the books and they didn't want their management to know because then they would get fired. 
So they w what they would do is create fake transactions in order to hide these losses, and they would just cross their fingers and hope that the markets would turn in their favor. And so because of this, a lot of banks now require uh, you to go on vacation or do job rotation. In other words, they require you to step away from your desk for at least a week or two and put somebody else in that desk. So if you are trying to create and you know, make this fraud keep going, it falls apart because you can no longer sit at your desk and continue these fake trades and things like that. Or the new person kind of figures out what's going on because the numbers just don't add up. So this is very big on Wall Street and um, especially in trading on the big trading desks. So e-commerce gives us a bunch of additional risk, right? Doing stuff on the internet, things like stolen credit card numbers, malicious software, phishing expeditions, right? A lot of issues um, go on with the internet. So some things like encryption and firewalls are put in place to try and combat these risks. As you've seen in the news, they don't, they're definitely not foolproof, but they help. So let's look at some internal controls over cash receipts and cash payments specifically. So cash requires some specific internal controls because it's so easy to steal and it's so easy to convert, right? I don't have to sell cash on Craigslist. As soon as I steal cash, I can go and buy whatever I want. So it's the easiest and most lucrative thing to steal, much better than inventory or property planning equipment, which then I have to figure out a way to convert to cash. So for over-the-counter stuff, we have point-of-sale terminals, cash registers, right? They provide control over cash receipts. They're going to record the sale, the cost of an item sold. They will automatically adjust the inventory account for a reduction in that item that was just sold. So it works very well as inventory control as well, right? The customer gets issued a receipt, which shows proof of purchase. Um, the sales associate turns in the drawer at the end of the shift right? And then usually the accounting department or some manager is going to reconcile the, what you have, the, the cash you have in the drawer with what the receipts say um, in the computer system you should have, right? And it should all add up. So any of you who have worked in a store or done this, you probably are ve very familiar with this process. At the end of your shift, you hand your register over to somebody and they tell you, oh, you had a dollar more than you were supposed to, or you are $5 short or whatever the case may be. What about when you send stuff by mail, like checks? So <clears throat> if you have ever paid a bill, let's say like your PG&E electric bill, right? You're sending in a check with what's called a remittance advice. That's just a fancy way of saying that little piece of paper that you rip off and write in how much money you're including with it. When the mail room at PG&E receives your envelope, they're going to separate the checks and separate those remittance advices. Those remittance advices will go to the accounting department. The checks will go to the treasurer, right? The treasurer will create a deposit ticket and deposit all the checks in the bank. Meanwhile, the accounting department will tally up all these um, little stu pay stubs that you included and figure out how much should be debited to cash, what the journal entry should be. At the end of the day, the controller will compare how much was deposited in the bank versus how much was written on those pieces of paper, and it should match. So let's look at pay, um, controls over payment by check. So most companies will make payments by check, and more so nowadays, EFT or electronic fund transfer, right? So electronic fund transfer. This is becoming more popular. In fact, internationally, this is huge. In the US, we've largely stuck to checks for a long time, but it's now moving to electronic fund transfers. And these are important because you get a record of the payment, right? There must be a signature by an authorized official, and the payment is supported by evidence. So this is why, as a common practice in business, you would never pay a bill in cash. You would have some kind of paper trail. So. For purchases and payments, again, you want to split the following duties. This is that concept of separation of duties, right? That, that I said for cash, this is almost always the case of what you want to do. So the person responsible for purchasing goods should be different than the person receiving the goods, and that should be different than the person preparing the check or payment, and then that should be different from the per approving the payment. So as you can see, when it comes to cash, you want to have different employees for a lot of different things. 
This is why small mom and pop restaurants and stores are often the biggest victims of fraud and stealing of cash because it's very unrealistic that they're going to be able to have somebody for each of these positions, right? Usually it's one person that does all of these things. So this is just a visual of, you know, how the process would work between big companies. So in this chapter, again, you read about Green Valley Coffee Company and their fraud um, that happened. But um, this is just a visual. I'm not sure if it's helpful or not. But, you know, when the Green Valley Coffee Company is wanting to buy something from Cisco Foods, they will send a purchase. They will create a purchase order, which will go to um, Cisco Foods, right? Cisco Foods will send both the whatever they're sending, plus an invoice for what they're sending to Green Valley Coffee Company. Green Valley Coffee Company will then do prepare a receiving report. So they're gonna compare this receiving report with what was originally um, ordered and the invoice that was sent to them. And if all of these things match, matches, 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 then they will send a check or an electronic fund transfer to Cisco Foods. So that's, how you, that's one way to try and minimize um, the potential for fraud. And this is what I talked about. So this is often called the payment packet, these three documents. You're going to check them because different people prepared this one and this one and this one. And so they should all match. If they don't, then you go back and figure out what the issue was. Petty cash, if you work in an office, there's usually somebody in the office with a drawer that has maybe like $500 in it. And this is meant to be for basic office expenses like... Um, you're ordering a pizza for a meeting or you need to tip the pizza guy or, you know, you're whatever the case may be. You just need a little bit of money. It's, it's their minor expenses. So generally, this drawer gets opened with a particular amount of cash. In my example, I said $500, for example. The person responsible for this drawer, the custodian will call them, um, they'll have a voucher list. So if they hand you $15 for a pizza, they will have you sign a little piece of paper saying, I took $15 for a pizza. And this system works based on the impressed system. This is just a fancy way of saying, if I count all of these vouchers that got created, plus whatever cash is left over in the drawer, if I add those two together, it should all equal back to my original $500 that I started with, right? So this is called an impressed system. Very often now, employees just get debit cards. So this is becoming a smaller issue, but there's still many offices that will have this petty cash account. Obviously, there are limitations of internal controls. So some ways that internal controls kind of break down. Well, if you have collusion or two or more people working together, if management overrides something, right? If management is is the internal control because they have to sign off for something, but they're in on the fraud, well, that's a problem, right? And then there's just human lim limitations. Um, humans are not computers, and some people get tired or they're just negligent, whatever the case may be, that you're bad at your job, you're playing on Facebook instead of paying attention. Um, so there's human limitations to what can happen. And the key thing is we can go and create some crazy internal controls, but we always have to think about benefits versus costs, right? The benefits have to outweigh the costs of any system. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. I'm not going to spend $20 to save $10, right? So um, that's how you have to think about it. So a very common example of this is if somebody shoplifts at a store, almost every single company has a policy that you are never to go and chase the shoplifter. Let them go, right? Why? Because if you go and chase the shoplifter and you get hurt or somebody else gets hurt or even killed, that company could be responsible for millions of dollars in damages. So is it really worth chasing after a $500 computer um, when you might be liable for millions of dollars in damages? No, it's not, right? So most stores will have that policy. And in fact, if you chase after somebody who shoplifts and tackle them and catch them until the, and hold them until the police come, you may feel like a hero and you save money to the store, but oftentimes you'll get fired for that because you broke the company rule. So this is the key um, kind of, you know, analysis that you need to get out of this chapter. This is preparing a bank reconciliation. So what is a bank reconciliation? Well, first, let's look at some um, documents that get used to control a bank account. A signature card. When you open a bank account, they're going to have this card that they're going to give you where you're going to put in your signature or whatever, right? 
And so that signature then gets compared to, you know, if you if there's a check that comes to the bank and they look and the signature is like way different, then the computer system will compare it. And so then they can say, wait, something's not right here, right? So that's one way the bank kind of prevents fraud is they have you do a signature card when you open your account. Um, then there's deposit tickets. If you go into a bank branch, you'll notice that whenever you want to put money in, you have to fill out a piece of paper, right? Saying what account, how much you're depositing, et cetera, et cetera. Again, it creates a trail. Checks we talked about. You have a bank statement. Usually this comes monthly. Every month you get a bank statement that shows all the ca what your cash balance is and all the transactions for that month, right? So what all the transactions were. And you prepare what's called a bank reconciliation. And again, we'll dive into that in a second. So signature card, this is just what I was saying. You know, you're going to sign on an account providing, a, you're going to provide a signature card if you're going to sign on an account just so they can compare your signature. This just protects against forgery, right? Deposit tickets, the customer fills out the deposit ticket and you receive a receipt when you make the deposit. Again, paper trails. A check has three parties to it, the maker, the payee, and the bank. So I should say, let me go a little bit deeper here. So the maker is whoever is writing the check, the payee is who it's going to, and the bank is what the which account it's being drawn on. on. So the bank statement again gets sent to a customer monthly, it reports all the cash activities, it starts with beginning balance, ending balance, and shows all cash that came in and all cash that went out. <clears throat> so here's an example from First National Bank. Um, if you have a bank account, you can pull one up yourself and see um, each bank will look a little bit different, right? In this case, they break out the deposits here, any fees they put here, um, any checks that were written they put here, and any other deductions that they had that are not related to checks. Um, so NSF is non-sufficient funds, meaning you wrote a check, but there was not, or somebody gave you a check, but they didn't have enough money in their account for the check. So the check bounces. That's usually what you hear when you go to the bank. The bank sends you back the check and says, this check is no good. And then you have to go chase after the person and say, hey, you wrote me a check, but it was no good. And EFT, again, is electronic fund transfer. So in this case, it looks like they paid for some insurance of $400 on December 20th. So a bank reconciliation explains the differences between the book, the company's cash records, and the bank balance. Okay? The differences are generally due to a time lag in transactions being recorded. So, for example, on the bank side... If I look at my, um, this, the bank statement that the bank sends me, there's a couple things that might be missing here. Perhaps I wrote a check. I already did my debits and credits, right? I wrote a check, but it hasn't shown up in the bank statement yet. So that would be an outstanding check. Or I process the deposit, but the bank hasn't finished processing it yet. So the deposit shows up on my books. I did my debit, cash, credit, whatever, service revenue, but um, the bank hasn't processed it yet. Or sometimes the bank just makes mistakes, right? So I look at my books and I show that I deposited 200. The bank shows that I deposited 20. I need to go to the bank and say, hey, you guys made a mistake. This doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Then if I look at my books, my cash balance on my books, right, in my general ledger, what I find is there might be some things that I don't have there yet that the bank did. So maybe the bank collected some money for me. This sometimes happens. If somebody owes me money, they might just go to Chase Bank and say, hey, I owe Eric some money. Um, can you deposit it into his account? So I may not realize they deposited it into my account and I never created the journal entry. So I, when I look at the bank statement, I see that they collected some money, and so that's how that works. Electronic fund transfers. So this is this example back here, right? There was an electronic fund transfer on 1220 that paid for insurance of 400. Well, I may have not known about that. That was just an automatic setup, so I need to do a journal entry for that. The bank might charge me service charges. I might earn some interest. 
there were some non-sufficient checks. I deposited some checks, I did the journal entry, and then my bank says, hey, this check that Mary wrote to you is no good. There's no money there. So now I have to undo my journal entry and go to Mary and say, hey, I have an account receivable now for you because your check was no good. Um, sometimes you have fees like paying for printed checks, or sometimes you made a mistake in your books and you need to correct it, right? So then your what happens is your bank side and your ba book side usually don't match. And you need to figure out why don't they match and make adjustments so that they do match. So let's go through an example here, right? So on the bank side, so this is looking at the bank balance, the bank statement and what is missing. Well, there was a deposit and transit of 1600. So I have the journal entry in my books for the 1600, but it's not on the bank statement yet. The bank made a mistake. The bank deducted $100 for a check that was written by another company. So I have to add $100 to the bank balance. And I have some outstanding checks, right? So I wrote some checks here that um, were, not, uh, were not processed by the bank yet. And then if I look at my cash balance on my books, on my accounting books, what I find is that the bank did some transactions that I didn't know about. So I need to create journal entries for this and get it into my books. So some of these transactions, an electronic fund transfer receipt of dividend revenue, right? So I had some investment that paid some dividends into my account of 900. Some client paid into my bank account an account receivable. So I didn't know about that. I have to go and adjust the account receivable, right? Um, so I'm going to be debiting cash, crediting accounts receivable there. Um, my interest revenue earned on my bank balance. So the cash that was sitting in the bank earned some interest. I didn't know about that until I looked at my bank statement. Um, I made a mistake, a book error. So check number 333 got recorded for $510, but the actual check was $150. So somebody made a mistake when they were putting in the numbers. So I have to add the difference to $360. That's just the difference between these two numbers to my book balance. The bank charged me $20 of a fee. Um, I got the non I've got a non-sufficient check from a customer of $50. So I have to make, you know, uh, I deposited a check and that check was no good. I have to subtract $50 from my book balance of cash. And um, I've had that electronic fund transfer payment of insurance of $400. So here's an actual reconciliation in Excel. And here's what you'll want to notice. As you see, this is the bank statement and my balance on at the end of the period, December 31st was 5,900. If I look at my books, my balance was 3,340. So they don't add up. And why? Why don't they add up? Well, here's why they don't add up. Because on my bank balance, my bank statement, I need I had a deposit in transit. So I have to add 1,600 to my balance that the bank statement shows. The bank made a mistake. So I have to add back that $100. Then I have some checks that the bank hasn't processed yet, but I already wrote them. So I already did my debits and credits and I wrote them, but the bank hasn't processed these four checks. So I have to subtract this from my balance. So my adjusted bank balance is 6,260. Then on my books, I had 3,340, but there were some things that the bank had processed that I had not shown here. So now I'm gonna make those adjustments. So I'm adding the 900 of dividend revenue. Um, I'm adding the 2100 that was collected on account receivable, the $30 of interest that I got from the balance in my account, and the $360 from correcting the error where somebody put in 500 and uh, or somebody put in 150 instead of 510 or whatever the case may be, right? So then I had some charges that I didn't know about, um, a service charge by the bank, a bad check that was written by one of my customers, and an electronic fund payment of insurance expense of 400. So I subtract that, and lo and behold, now they agree, right? Now this equals this equals this. And that's what a bank reconciliation does. We figure out why there's a difference and then get to the bottom line, which should equal. This is an important concept. You remember that all of this that was on the bank statement but not in my books, I need to get it into my books. How do we get it into our books? Journal entries. So as you can see, I have to, and you'll notice, because this is a chapter on cash and this is a bank reconciliation of cash, 
all the journal entries have cash as one of the components, right? So here's the explanation for each one. So on December 31st, I received some dividend revenue from my investment. So my cash went up by 900. I earned dividend revenue of 900. And here was the explanation, right? So here are all the journal entries. So these journal entries represent all of these transactions here. So make sure you kind of follow along and do these journal entries and that you feel comfortable with them. So here's kind of a summary of some of the reconciling items. For a bank balance, you're always going to add deposits in transit, subtract outstanding checks, add or subtract corrections of bank errors. So you're starting, this is starting with the bank statement and making these adjustments. Here you're starting with your book amount and you're going to add any bank collections, interest revenue, and EFT receipts. You'll subtract any service charges, non-sufficient fund checks, and electronic fund payments, and then you'll add or subtract any corrections of book errors. So depending on the book error, you might be adding or subtracting. Here's just a little bit more detail showing all the different um, uh, account history for a specific account. So this just shows you another place where you can kind of see you know, the, the individual transactions. And we'll, don't stress too much about this. We're going to go in class. We're going to work a problem that basically is something exactly like this, right? So we're going to go and uh, spend some time with this in class doing a problem, and you'll have some problems for homework and quizzes and everything. So you'll go through this, but hopefully this lecture helps uh, give you an idea of what, what it is you're trying to accomplish and what you need to do. So finally, how do we report cash on the balance sheet? So the line item, as I showed you, is cash and cash equivalents, right? So if we just quickly go back, you can see on Apple's 10K, this is called cash and cash equivalents. So what does cash equivalents actually mean? Well, time deposits, think like checking and savings accounts. Certificates of deposit, also known as CDs, this is where you give the bank your money for like some fixed period of time, six months, 12 months, whatever, and they pay you a higher rate of interest, and you agree to leave that money there for that period of time. And also very high-grade U.S. or foreign government securities that are close to maturity. So it's things like three-month treasury bills. We consider those cash equivalents. Why? because they are very liquid. You can sell these in two seconds and have cash two seconds later, right? So three month US treasury bills are an example of cash equivalents. Um, when you look into the 10K, excuse me, had a sneeze there. Uh, when you look into the 10K, you'll see that there's usually a footnote around cash equivalents and they will describe specifically what it is that they put in and you can see all highly liquid investments maturities of three months or less and um, this could be a little bit different for each company there are some rules around it but generally um, you know some companies will not hold anything less than or more than three months some companies may go out more a little bit more than three months but stuff that is very very liquid highly liquid so that's it for chapter four. So this was our introduction to the first line item of the balance sheet, um, which is cash and some of the issues that, um, you know, are important for cash. So hopefully this was helpful and um, we'll be kicking off chapter five here shortly.